in bringing uh, one project and talking about construction, I decided to uh, talk a little bit about how one follows a different path in terms of materials and technology. And the curbside project that I'm going to talk about is an interesting one for a few reasons. I think the first is that this is a project at the intersection of digital technology and physical spaces. And to get to that, I thought I would use a few examples of um, both fabricating and digital technology. One of the things that I find a little bit uh, tiresome is that when architects talk about digital, what they tend to talk about is making things with robots. And I've been making things with robots for about 20, 25 years. We've had a robot in the studio for more than 20 years. And, and frankly, I'm really bored with talking about fabrication using digital technology. And so this project isn't about how you make things with digital. It's how you make things for new digital industries and how you think about the city in, in the moment of digital technology. So I think to talk about a few things that led to this, um, for me, I've been interested in using the digital tools not to make things more complicated, but to make things simpler, lighter, uh, less expensive, and integrated. And an example of that is in this chair for Vitra, the ravioli chair, instead of building a chair out of more components because we had digital technology, we tried to build a chair that was just built in two parts. Now, what happens when you build something in fewer parts is you usually save weight, which means you save money, and it is more easily assembled. So we took that logic into buildings, and in specifically in this curbside pavilion. The, the second thing is that I've always been very interested in building in plastics and looking at how architecture can start to use a logic of plastics um, to find a language and also to find a method of construction. So with plastics, and the curbside pavilion is all plastic, you start to use curvature not for formal reasons, but actually for structural stiffness. With plastics, you can also begin to integrate detail, you can integrate function, and you can integrate sometimes more than one function all into the same surface. And again, you can eliminate mechanical details. And mechanical, I just mean uh, fasteners, like bolts and, and mechanical connections. So where I first started using composites is in this renovation of the site Santa Fe Museum, where we started to build big scale composites. And we did this with a, a fabricator that, that used to build boats. For this dermatology institute, we use composites to build a whole series of examination rooms, which could be prefabricated off-site and just brought in and installed into the building as very large components. And, and these interior components are about the scale of one of these curbside pavilions. And, and you can see it also in the Bloom House, we, uh, we used for the, for the ceiling a translucent composite uh, which had a lot of structural stiffness on its own. So there's no additional structure to that. It's the shell that provides the structure. And also with all the furniture and details in the house, we were using plastic. So instead of a, a handle to pull a cabinet, all of that gets integrated into the surface. So, so this idea of eliminating parts, so you're reducing labor, um, and also having surfaces perform more than one function um, is something we were studying a lot. The, the other thing, if you're going to build in plastics or composites, is that you put all the information into a mold. 
So instead of putting all the information into a series of methods of assembly, you tend to put all the detail you can into one mold, and then you form the materials into that mold. So this is as big as a building. It's a, it's a boat that I designed for myself. And in the process of this, I learned everything I needed to know in terms of construction. And I would really encourage all of the students to not necessarily think about construction the way an architecture professor would tell you. I think it's very useful to look at other industries and see how other industries build things and see how you can translate that back into construction, building construction. So, because if I hadn't done this, I would have had no authority to talk about the construction of the curbside buildings. So, but again, all of the information is in the mold. I think more than any other boat that's been made, this boat is built in fewer parts. So, and, and that's a lot because we had a lot of the 3D skills. So, all of these uh, components, the, the major components you're seeing, there were only eight parts. So, eight pieces were put together to achieve that. And then all of the detailed pieces, we built the boat in less than 50 elements. So um, it, it's really because we put the time into the design of the surfaces, and the surfaces had all the detail. Um, the reason you do that with a boat is because the lighter it is, the faster it goes. So you can see we're going faster than a boat with a motor. Um, and it's because that entire construction only weighs about 3,800 pounds. So, um, you know, less than two metric tons with people and equipment and everything on it. So, and, and it's a boat that goes about uh, 50 kilometers an hour. So it's only because it's lightweight. And building things light, I think you heard this also about the island, the logistics of moving things to a site and constructing them is very important. So if you can make lightweight structures, it means you can also build things differently and, and approach construction differently. <coughs> okay, so the other thing that I think is very important that I wouldn't have even had this project if I wasn't looking at robotics, not for building, but robotics for moving pieces of buildings and looking at how things move in a city. So we did some experiments uh, for a festival uh, the, in Cordric, Belgium, where we built a room that we could move around. That room went to Facebook for three months. It went to Red Bull for two months. And all over Silicon Valley, people started asking for moving conference rooms and moving desks and moving buildings. And I actually started a company dedicated to building mobile furniture. Like, not, not mobile, but actually furniture that drives around in a room using your cell phone. And through those connections is how I got to curbside. So, Sometimes if you have an intuition about something, it's worth following it. I have to say I didn't know where that would go, but I would say most of the business I'm involved in right now is because of looking at literally moving building parts and, and using mobility. Um, to do that, we, we learned a couple of things. First, how to build custom robotic structure, meaning mechanisms that could move things at a room scale and also how to think about interactivity and an interface, like how you would reconfigure a room and what kinds of technologies you'd need to do that. So it started with some very generic robots. So this is what every school of architecture seems to want to have. I, I actually am starting to think these things are really um, not so useful. But, but here we were using uh, two robotic arms to begin to move a wall element and study the movement of a wall. And this we did with a grant from uh, the Salk Institute. But building the software that would move and record the walls and being able to do it with a human being there that doesn't get hurt by the robot 
is what let us start to think about this in terms of building components. In Cordrick, we built this rolling room, and again, we studied it on these robot arms. But if you look, all the furniture always stays flat. So here we were just tumbling it to make sure the furniture would always stay gimbaled. But eventually, we replaced that big blue robot with a very simple mechanical system and a control on a telephone. So you see all those elements on the wall that, that flip. Okay, so we, we then moved to building that in a much more elegant way. And, and that involved building what you see on the base, which is a simple robotic mechanism, but then also building an interface for someone to be able to articulate that room in whichever axis they would want to, also with some presets. And this is at SF MoMA right now, where you can actually go to the model and drive the model around. Um, but all of these mechanisms were built at, at a small scale initially. You could just see how, you know, the, the literal mechanical or mechatronic elements, as well as the, the digital interface for it. Okay, so then we built it up. We, we kept going in scale and in scale and in scale. This is the thing that was at Facebook for a while. What's funny is you take it to an architecture faculty or you show it in a museum with, arch with architects, what you always get is troubleshooting from the architects. Like, how will you deal with plumbing and electricity? How is building code going to interpret this? Which is great. But when you go to Silicon Valley and show this, what they immediately start to ask you is what are the business opportunities? How much does it cost? How long does it take to make one? How light can you make it? Can it go in an existing building? Can I have one right away? Um, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg, first thing he did was jump inside it and ask to have him roll around, whereas all the architects were <laughs> arm's length. And I think that's a real problem our field has, is it's not very entrepreneurial. Like, I would hope, and I love the question that that first question was, I would hope nobody would have any of those questions when I'm done talking. The other thing when you have a building component that moves is you need to make sure it's intelligent. So it has to have sensing in it. So it needs to measure space. It needs to measure the atmosphere of the environment. And once you get that sensing, you want to be able to have feedback, meaning that if something's going to move, you want it to measure what's happening in the space and then move accordingly with feedback. Same way they control temperature in a room. So, and then once you do that, then you can be collecting data. And frankly, in the world today, the data that the building collects is often going to be worth more than the building. So the question we get now, both with curbside and also with Piaggio Fast Forward I'll talk to you about, is everyone wants to know who's going to own the data about the building and how are you going to use it in some way um, critically and, and um, opportunistically. So the, the one example I would show of sensing is this microclimate chair that I'm doing with Nike right now for the NBA. And we launched this chair at the Salone a little while ago, but it's a chair that measures the weight, the, the moisture in your breath, and the moisture on your skin, and it measures the, your temperature. And based on those measurements, the whole surface is covered in heating and cooling Peltier chips, and it can selectively heat and cool different parts of your body. So for a basketball player during the game, if they come off just for two minutes, we can bring their body temperature down by a degree by cooling their spine, but we can be heating up their legs so that they don't cramp up before they go back out on the court again. But the, the thing about it is that the chair is in feedback with the athlete on it. And, and again, all that hardware and software 
you know, I, I own all that. We developed it all in the office, and we figured out even how to do the programming for simple Raspberry Pi processors to control that whole system. So, you know, it, it, it's important. All of this stuff is what ends up leading to the curbside. Okay, so to talk about curbside, um, this is a, a system of buildings. So we didn't build a building for a site and start with a site. We, we had no site, but we knew that we had to build a big number of these in an efficient way. So because we're building hundreds and eventually thousands of them, you don't want to have to build it like you build a building. You want to build a mold and then be able to pop these things off the mold in a very, in a more rapid way than you could construct a building. Um, they need to be very easy to transport, meaning they, it helps if they're lightweight, but you also don't want to spend a lot of time putting them together. So you want to have as few pieces as possible. Um, the third thing, which is more of a business thing, is that the building turns out to really be the identity for the company. So I don't get an architecture fee for this. I own a very big piece of the company because I'm defining their whole identity all over the world. So instead of getting a fee one time to do one building, um, I participate. And, and frankly, now every building project that we're working on, we've managed to convince our clients that we participate, meaning that we get ownership of part of the company that we're designing for. And frankly, every other industry works that way, except the design industry. Um, and architecture has more authority than, let's say, graphic design, and, and I think it's a very interesting way of practicing. But, but this building is, is not sited and serving a function for one place. This is a system, and, and it's a system that has to communicate uh, for a company that's a digital company that doesn't really have any idea about how they show up in the physical world. So what curbside is, is it's a competitor to Amazon. So instead of ordering something on a phone or on a computer and having it delivered to your office or your house, here you order something on this application and you then pick it up at, at, a, at, a, at a site. And it lives on your telephone, mostly. Most people use it on their phone. You can also use it on a, on a computer. So what you do is you go to Google Play or you go to the Apple Store and you download the application. And the application then takes some control of your phone uh, what's actually been most successful about them is they use the Bluetooth, the GPS, and even the cell signals so they don't always drain your phone's battery. So, and because they use those three things, one of the requirements is it has to have an antenna that's about uh, eight meters up in the air. So, the way it works is from your phone, you shop stores that are in your neighborhood or in your city, and they treat those stores the same way Amazon treats their fulfillment centers. So they take over the inventory of a shopping mall, or they take over the inventory of a Target store, or they take over the inventory of 4,000 pharmacies across the United States, and you can then access what's in inventory on your phone and buy it then people collect it and send you a notification that what you ordered is ready. And then every time you get close, somebody carries that, the goods out to the curb. And this is, these are the cities that it's in in America. They're in about 8,000 different locations. Um, there tend to be, this is a very urban system, tends to be where there's a fair amount of density. And this is what it looks like when you're shopping on a, on a computer screen. You, it's very similar to any kind of online retail. 
This is what it looks like when you shop off of your, your phone. And this is what actually happens behind the scenes. So if you buy something, like here somebody's bought socks, it sends a message to a person at a store or in a mall. That person gets the message on their phone, they go into the store, they pull the inventory, put it in a bag, and then they check that all of that inventory out from the stores and consolidate it into a bag. <clears throat> and this is a startup. This company's been around two years. So what they had were thousands of these tents, and they would put the bags in the tents, and then they wait until people would come pull up, and then they walk out to the car and bring it to you. And again, what they do is they, they, turn, they call your telephone every 10 minutes or so. And by knowing which cell phone tower you're near, they know how close you are to your stuff. Once you get within five kilometers, they turn the GPS on on your telephone and they start to track you. Then once you get within about, I would say, one kilometer or less, they turn on your Bluetooth and then they know where you are within a kilometer. So as you drive up in a car, well, not you, as your telephone drives up in a car, they know that that's the telephone that made the order. So as you drive up, they're walking out to your car. The average, for the building departments, we had to find out the average transaction time. It's less than 13 seconds. So somebody slows down and stops for 13 seconds and drives away on average. So it's a very streamlined process. But the thing is, the tent is not the identity they want as a company. So when they talk to people, they said, what's your impression of curbside? And they said, oh, you're the people with the tent. So they came to me to find out how to come up with a new identity and also how to make that so we could build thousands of them affordably. Not as, you know, they're more expensive than a tent. but. So what, what we began with as an identity was something that would have some relationship to digital maps and also something that had a relationship to physical maps. And when we looked at mapping and when we looked at the way people see the city on their phone, they tend to do it with pins. So you drop a pin. And so the language for the building became a physical pin and that physical pin then knows who you are in some fairly subtle ways. So again, we had to design a system. So for a large volume store, like a, like a big shopping mall or a Target, they have these big pickup pods. And that's really just because of the amount of stuff that needs to be stored and the number of people working in them. We have a smaller one, which is the canopy. And then in some locations, we just simply have what we call a pin, which is uh, more of a, a wayfinding device for people that are picking their stuff up. Um, this is one at the Glendale Galleria, and most of these are in Southern California. And you can see we incorporate the storage, charging. It's, um, we can't rely on electricity on all of these, so some of them are powered by solar, some of them are powered powered by batteries that get charged every night. Um, the building gets assembled in less than a day by two people with a very, very small crane. So before they get delivered, we drill anchors and epoxy in the anchoring. And then in one day, a small team of people shows up and you have one of these. You can also take them apart and move them to a different location if you want. Um, and they fit into one flatbed truck. So we can actually put three of them on a flatbed truck. So the logistics of how you put them together and make them is very much a part of, of how they're designed. And again, in the top of the pin, there's a, a special Bluetooth antenna, a GPS antenna, and a wireless antenna. And they need to be fairly high when you get into places where the buildings are high because it's line of sight in terms of how they communicate. This is just kind of how those transactions work. Like I said, it's just 13 seconds as people come up and pull around. <clears throat> 
And because there, we're looking at places where we're going to have more than one, where we might have two or three all in a line, we wanted to have a way that someone in a car would know which one to pull up to. So, and, and this, and, and these are the kinds of places you see, you see these now. But so, in order to have more than one and have a person get in a relationship with one, we've used that same, well, very similar robotic technology for both control and building a, a fairly low cost um, turntable where, I'll go back, where you can see the pin will actually follow wherever your telephone is. So if you pull into a parking lot, it'll be facing you, and as you drive in, it follows you. And it also changes color, and it changes color on your phone. So your phone background will turn red, and the pin will be red, and you'll know to go to the red one rather than, say, the blue one or a different colored one. So it interacts with you as well. And this is the prototype. We haven't implemented this yet, but when we built the pods, we built them with a joint so that we can install that small turntable you see. This is at a half, one half scale, so the, the actual ones double that size. But so that's following a, a phone signal, and also we can change the color. That's easy with the interface. But again, for me, the more interesting construction details are, oh, and we could put a camera in it as well, so that curbside can also be knowing who the customer is as they're coming in and be collecting data as they do that. Okay, so, so for me, the question of construction, it's changed. I think we should be building buildings differently than we do and thinking about assembly and transport and recycling and all these issues in building components. And I think it helps to look outside of architecture for a lot of that. But for me, construction is really about addressing contemporary cities. And frankly, if all you want to do is build buildings, you're going to be very downstream. I don't know if that term makes sense in Italian, but what I mean downstream is Somebody's going to have a program, they're going to have an idea about the city, they're going to have a site, they're going to get a bank. By the time the architect gets involved, there's very little for you to do except build the building. But the curbside pavilion, for me, even though they're small, it, it's a different way of being an architect. I mean, I was involved with the company at an early stage to talk to them about if they even needed a building. We talked about what those buildings should be and how they should be technical. We introduced movement into them. We designed the whole relationship that a customer has with their company as they come up to these things. Um, we, we work with their staff and are constantly updating details based on talking to the people that work there. It's a very different relationship than having somebody give you a brief and a budget and doing a building and walking away. So, and, and again, it's entrepreneurial. You also, you get to participate in a different kind of an economic relationship as well if you don't sit so downstream but move a little bit more upstream. Um, so then just because I'm in Milan and, and I'm in Milan every six or eight weeks because I've been working for the last year with uh, Piaggio Group and Piaggio Group I'm sure you know, they, they, have, they build Vespas, they build Motoguzzi, build Aprilia, Gilera, um, but they're very interested in cities and they're very interested in how mobility is gonna change as cities become more digital and as you have self-driving cars, as you have taxis and Ubers and Lyfts that are also self-driving, they find that your generation tends not to buy a car, you share a car, or you even share a motorcycle or a scooter. Um, and they're doing a lot of experiments in Milan with scooter sharing and things. And so they, they asked, really from the perspective of urbanism, for me to work with them and with Jeffrey Schnapp and a number of other people to 
build a new company in the United States, to look at autonomous vehicles, and to look at this new economy of information and data, and figure out how they need to respond to cities of the future. And I think in the United States, you don't find anymore a large company that doesn't have an architect on their board. So with this new company, Piaggio Fast Forward, I'm the chief creative officer. Um, that's a title that I think, you know, one out of every five or 10 people in this room should try to have in the next 10 years of your career. Because chief creative officer is strategic, but it's also a kind of general cultural task where you're taking care of things like the city, you write the program, you figure out uh, what the needs are. So it, it's, uh, it's a, a task that an architect is particularly good at. So what we're defining at Piaggio Fast Forward, or what we defined in the last year, is a logistical problem. How do you work with transportation? How do you work with positioning? Uh, meaning so that a, a robot knows where it is. And how do you address, meaning how do you interact with people? And how do you interact with people that need things moved or that move on things? Um, so th this is the world that you can't afford not to think about. I mean, it used to be that you would make a street and people would go shopping on your street. Well, I have news. In the United States, something like 60, 65% of retail is now happening in a place like this. So people are shopping on their phones and they're shopping online and goods are getting distributed in a place like this. This is an Amazon fulfillment center and they're getting distributed through the city by big trucks and vans, um, and it's, it's not very efficient at all. And there's no vision of the city that these companies are thinking about. They're taking the city as it is and overlaying on it as software. These are all data and software people. They're not architects, they're not urbanists, they're not designers. Uh, they really don't think about the experience after you've bought the goods. So they think a lot about the experience on your phone, but after you've bought something, it, it, it's a problem they're not very good at thinking about. So the vision right now of a city by the five largest companies on earth is trucks and cars that drive themselves and aerial drones that fly around in the sky for that last mile. And, and personally, at Piaggio Fast Forward, because we're not a car company, our vision of the city is people, pedestrians, bicyclists, people on scooters, people on motorcycles, not with trucks and cars, but with small land drones. Things the size of a scooter, but that are carrying goods, carrying groceries, carrying food, doing all that distribution and they go inside and out of buildings because they're electric powered. So um, at ICMA in November, we'll launch some of these initiatives and in February we'll be back in Milan and we'll be launching our first land drones and, and they're intelligent vehicles, but you know, they're like furniture. It's like a chair that follows you around the city and it follows you right into the elevator and up to your desk. So the, that idea of an architect being involved at the very earliest stage of a technology like that that's gonna change urbanism in cities, to me that's the kind of construction that I'm, I'm very interested in. It has a big impact on buildings, but you have to think a little broader to, to connect with that. So, and again, this is kind of the space we're in. And, and it, if it wasn't an Italian company, we wouldn't be in this space because we're not interested in a self-driving car and we're not interested in a military style aerial drone. We're doing autonomous scooters and motorcycles that take care of people and goods, that shuttle people around and shuttle, shuttle goods around. 
And, and also, we're working with Alejandro Zairopolo. The One of the big launches, we're going to have 10 of these things running around in, in Seoul for the, for the Biennale on the city. But I think a lot of architects are working in this space. I, I think it doesn't get talked about quite enough at the schools. So thanks.